Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing my videos is really important because I am a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising, so social media is how I grow. So please follow me at SYL Tales on Twitter and any other social media known to man. I'm on them all. You can find them on the About page for this channel. I would appreciate your support via a spot on my website where you can contribute further, and there are links to that in my description box. So here we are, Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 10, The Timeless Children. Well, as a non-spoiler review, I can tell you that for the first time in the Chibnall era, now full 20 episodes, I have a story that I can unreservedly recommend. <laughs> This was a good story. It changed a lot about what we thought we knew about the Doctor and her backstory. And unfortunately, the curse of the Fandai Master was visited upon me. It was, as I predicted, sort of an implementation of the Cartmo Master Plan. But for Padawans, casual fans, and casual viewers, not even going to be an issue. You will enjoy it. And even if you suffer under the curse of the Fandai Masters, as I do, I still enjoyed it. I thought it was a good script. So, unlike most reviewers, I do not sit down and just rehash the plot, pausing to talk about what I liked or I didn't like. You always get far more depth out of me than any other reviewer because I touch on everything in terms of how the film is made, the acting, the directing, the cinematography, all the mechanics of making a film. So we will just take it as read that if you have come to this video looking for a review of Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 10, The Timeless Children, then you've already watched it, or you just don't care if you have it spoiled for you. But in any case, just to be safe, we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a Fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. And this is neither a boast nor a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. Unfortunately, this makes Fandai masters cursed, because we cannot see the new stuff for the entire century that came before. We discover there isn't that much that's really original, and it sometimes interferes with our ability to enjoy things. And in fact... The curse of the Fandai Master was visited upon me with this episode of Doctor Who. But that was okay. I still liked it. One thing I don't do is outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers who are simply actors portraying outrage because they discovered after The Last Jedi that outrage sells. They hate everything as a knee-jerk reflex because that's what the viewers want to see, is people hating things. But this causes a weird feedback loop between fans and popular reviewers, and ultimately it turns out that nobody can like anything no matter how good it is. So I don't do outrage. If I like something, I'll tell you why in detail. If I don't like it, I'll tell you why in detail. But I do not do outrage because unlike all the other reviewers, I am the adult in the room. So I always like to start out saying something good about something. And damn, there was the good things to say about this. I have a lot of great moments here for the first time in the Chibnall era. And I'm rather surprised about it. And at the same time, very, very happy. I was getting very tired of nothing but cringe moments. To begin with, of course, the Master, he is a lot of fun. He's always a lot of fun. Doctor Who always manages to find excellent actors and actresses to play the Master. And I do enjoy him, don't get me wrong. I really get a kick out of him. I'm going to talk about his acting in, in a little bit. But I, I, while I do enjoy him, I do sort of miss when the Doctor and the Master were more exchanging wits. They were battling each other's wits rather than Master just being outright lunatic all the time. Uh, for my money, the original Master, the Roger, Roger Delgado, who played the Master against Pertwee's third Doctor, will always be my favorite. Uh, but again, that is not to say that I dislike Sajid Duan as the Master. I love him very much. Another great moment. Um, is learning, that, of course, that the Doctor is from an alternate dimension or an alternate universe. We don't know which. We don't know more about that. There are still pieces of that puzzle to be unraveled. That is one of the great things, the really great things that this episode does, is it sets up any number of different mysterious things about the Doctor that they could go off into a direction to check on, to find out, to 
any number of things. It's really, really good that way. Um, she was found by an ancient Gallifreyan space explorer from the time before the Time Lords. And this place is the Doctor, get this now, at least a billion years in Gallifrey's past, prior to when um, Rassilon and Omega created the, the technology that gave Gallifrey time travel and created the society of the Time Lords. So keep that in mind. A billion years ago. A billion years years and we know it's been a billion years because in david Tennant's last episode the end of time rassilon explicitly stated and i quote a billion years of time lord history riding on our backs the doctor goes back now more than a billion years now human beings ancestors have been around for about six million years meaning that when proto-humans were picking up uh, ants and grubs, Gallifrey had rudimentary interstellar space travel for at least 994 million years. And modern humans have existed for only 200,000 years, and civilization as we know it has only been around for 6,000 years, and we are putting the doctor a billion years in the past. Another good thing, the Time Lords having uh, been around all that time, and so now, so has the Doctor. So let's think about this for a minute and run the math. Um, when we saw Matt Smith's Doctor, he aged from youth to old age in something like 400 years. Now, if we assume that an average Time Lord incarnation ages from you know, young to death in about 600 years. That means that with 12 regenerations, an average Time Lord could expect to live about 7,200 years. So, aside from the Doctor and the Master, and until the last great Time War, the Time Lords mostly just stayed on Gallifrey. They were in never any, any real danger of their lives, and so they generally lived about 7,200 years. But the doctor from Hartnell to the present has been burning through her regenerations like a madwoman because she lives an incredibly dangerous life. But if the doctor um, has existed since the dawn of Time Lord history and assuming that she didn't always live 2700 years per, per uh, lifetime, then this still leaves something on the order of 130,000 incarnations of the doctor. 130,000 with no upper limit. She is, in fact, actually immortal, under some, except under some special circumstances, which basically are disintegrating her, completely destroying her body. But in terms of that, otherwise, the Doctor is immortal. She will never die. And assuming the Doctor Who is around for another 50 years, I'm sure that producers who are going to be on the 100th anniversary of the Doctor are going to be very, very happy that they don't have to worry about this whole regeneration thing ever again. Now, certainly, many variations, uh, versions of the Doctor have probably lived a full 12 regenerations on Gallifrey. But in order for her not to know about it, the Time Lords must have been completely wiping her mind every 12 regenerations. That means that they have wiped the Doctor's mind about 10,800 times. The Peter Capaldi Doctor was the only one to not have his memory erased after 12. Now we know that it's possible to give a re new regeneration cycle to a Time Lord because that's exactly what was offered to the Master in the show's 20th anniversary episode, The Five Doctors. And that means that the Time Lords didn't give the Doctor a new regeneration cycle at the end of Matt Smith's incarnation. He always had the ability to regenerate past well. They must, in fact, have given him basically a lot of regeneration energy in order to destroy all of the forces that were coming on at the time. They were basically... Um, Counting on the Doctor, assuming that he was getting a new regeneration cycle, when in fact all they were doing was jiggering around. All of this actually fits with a number of things that we've seen previously in Doctor Who. In the episode The War Games, which was the second Doctor's final episode, the uh, Doctor is put on trial. However, since he had a far greater influence in Time Lord society, they didn't 
imprison him or kill him. They came up with a rather flimsy excuse that they thought he would ha be a, they would have need of him at some point in the future and then exiled him to Earth. From the Third Doctor's era until the last great Time War, the Time Lords used him for special occasions even during his exile on Earth. And at one point, he was actually elected to the um, Lord High President, uh, let's see, what is it? Lord, yeah, the Lord High President of the Council of Time Lords, effectively the King of Gallifrey. And they even let him keep the title for a long time after he ran off with the TARDIS, and, and, and this was about the Fifth Doctor. But would they really have elected a complete renegade who had spent four incarnations off planet? And then during the Fourth Doctor's era, something very very, very interesting happened. In the episode, The Brain of Morbius, we saw a number of incarnations of what looked like the Doctor very briefly on screen. The production staff at the time um, of that episode, they decided that these had been um, previous incarnations of the Doctor before Hartnell because during that episode, at that time in production, the regeneration, the 12 regeneration limit, hadn't been placed on the Doctor yet. So from that episode until today, till yesterday, literally till yesterday, fans have always tried to rationalize who all these various people are. Well, we now know. The answer is simple. They were around, they were previous to the Doctor's current incarnations. They are one of the approximately 130,000 of her running around right now. In fact, um, as her uh, various incarnations are flashing through the Doctor's mind uh, in this episode, when she pulls herself out of the Matrix, we actually see a couple of these guys. So, uh, for those of you who uh, make fan films, you no longer need to worry about putting your fan film anywhere into continuity. It can be any one of the approximately 130 thousand doctors running around over the course of a billion years a billion years that is a really long time <laughs> anyway the next time the doctor was put on trial during the sixth doctor's era the prosecutor was some nebulous incarnation of the doctor who called himself the valyard and the doctor would constantly make fun of his name i'd get a kick out of the best one i thought was when he said oh the graveyard you know Anyway, who the Valyard was was uh, very nebulous. It was stated that he existed somewhere, he came somewhere from the Doctor's twelfth and final incarnations, whatever the hell that meant at the time, and everybody's been trying to rationalize it ever since. But now, deems damn near anything is what it means, because we've got 130,000 versions of the Doctor running around. <laughs> it also means that the Doctor wasn't always necessarily a good guy, and with 130,000 incarnations, that isn't very surprising, to be honest. Now, one has to wonder, knowing the show's history as I do, maybe, what if the Master isn't one of her 130,000 incarnations? Because, in fact, if, if uh, actor Roger Delgado, who played the Master during the Third Doctor's era, hadn't unexpectedly died there was a story arc planned for that Doctor that would have revealed that the Master was sort of the dark side of the Doctor and they were going to merge together at the very end of that um, arc. And this story, you could still do that story. And all of this, all of this stuff is very, very, very good. It is, as I mentioned, an implementation of the Cartmel Master Plan, and in some ways it's even more epic than what Cartmel had intended, and it leaves a lot of possibilities for future stories and arcs, and I hope that Chibnall and future producers have the brains to go and explore them. This really opens up a whole bunch of stuff. And now, since we've had this arc implemented, I'm going to go ahead and talk about the Cartmel Master Plan that I have previously said go and read if you want to hear about it. But here is what... Because the Cardinal Master Plan will now never be implemented. Maybe a piece of it, but it'll never be implemented. So we can talk about it now. Here is what the Cardinal Master Plan was. That was a name coined by fans. It wasn't the name used internally with production. Uh, internally, they just thought of this as sort of a general direction. They didn't have a real arc necessarily planned out for it. But it was going to be a ten attempt, an explicit attempt, to restore some of the mystery of the Doctor and the Time Lords after years of overexposure and overfamiliarity, which, until today, that is where we stood with the Doctor, in fact. And it was going to be an arc or something for the Seventh Doctor and would have been implemented had that series not been canceled. And in fact, 
if you're listening really closely, there are some occasional hints dropped about this, but not many. So the story was going to be of early time Lord history. Now, this is what we've been told before, and none of things that happened in this episode contradict this. The story is that two Time Lords, Rassilon and Omega, did a technobabble thing that gave the Time Lords the energy necessary to do time travel. But in the process of doing this technobabble thing, Omega was thought killed. In fact, he was pushed into some kind of alternate universe, and we saw him then in this universe in Classics Who's 10th, episode, 10th anniversary episode, The Three Doctors. And then we also saw Omega again in the fifth Doctor episode, Arc of Infinity. Now that's the story that we'd been told and we'd seen, but under the Cardinal Master Plan, it would have been discovered that there weren't two Time Lords involved, but rather three. Rassilon, Omega, and a shadowy figure called the Other. Now one guess as to whom the Other would have been. Uh, this would have been explored, this actually was explored later in various uh, non-canonical novels and uh, other media. Um, I've never read them, so I don't know how that works out. But I suggest, frankly, that you look at the wiki link to the Cartmel Master Plan that's in my description box, and you will be able to see the names of those various novels, and you can go and read them, or there's some audio dramas, too. If you want to listen to them, you can. But as far as I know, nothing in this episode would make it impossible for the Doctor to be known as the Other while working with Rassilon and Omega. They could still implement that if they wanted to. Now, I have to mention, I have to mention, surprise to me, this does in fact create something of an arc for this season. I'm going to have to sit and I'm going to have to reevaluate just a little bit about half of the uh, series or six episodes. It's not, in my opinion, a very well executed arc uh, in the way that prior showrunners have done it. But it is at least an arc, which is something that I've been searching for this whole time. It uh, leaves a, um, a lot of... Uh, uh, room for further uh, season-long arcs that can then lead up to a Doctor-long arc that would culminate when the Doctor regenerates, as we've seen in prior Doctors. This is the way that modern Doctor Who has worked with other showrunners, and I certainly, Chris, if you're watching, <laughs> I certainly I suggest that you keep going with this, go even further. Um, just, you know, keep the knee-jerk wokeness that makes Star Trek's Let That Be Your Last Battlefield look subtle. Keep that out of the episodes, but Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. That's the one where the guys who are half black and half white, one on the opposite sides, and they hated each other. You know, Chibnall stuff has been making that look subtle. But I encourage you, Chris, please go even further with this. This is good stuff. Graham and Yas's conversation was very in character. Given everything else in the episode, I have to wonder if maybe we aren't seeing these three characters exit the series. If so, I'm actually okay with that. However, the next time we get a companion, it should be only one companion. There really isn't enough time. I've said this before. I'll say it again. There is not enough time in a season of only 10 or 12 episodes to develop the Doctor and three companions. Do the math. Ten divided by four. Ain't much left. So do one companion just so that you only have two characters that you have to do development for. And there's, you know, ten divided by two. Do the math, you know. Other good things. The human masquerading as Cybermen. That is something, you know, putting on a cyber suit and just pretending to be a Cyberman is something that I have wondered about off and on for many years. And so it was nice to finally see someone go out and do it. Ryan be able to, being able to destroy, destroy that squad of Cybermen with that basketball sort of bomb. That was nice because we can see that he has changed physically. He, what he can do physically has changed during his time with the Doctor. You know, to be honest, it would be nice to see him sometime just sort of casually riding a bicycle somewhere. I would just cement home what, how he's changed. I really love the master just casual sort of dispensing with a shot, the formerly uh, lone Cyberman, with barely a thought. <laughs> just turn, boom, and the antagonist of the entire last two and a half episodes is gone like that and the only thing the master has to say is oh dang it i was too trigger happy i should have say, said you need to be uh cut down to size you know <laughs> i do love the master and how he's written 
the master, his uh, motivation, because I've been wondering why would the master destroy Gallifrey totally? Well, but it now makes a certain level of sense. The master wanted to destroy the doctor's legacy, and that includes, uh, since she was the timeless child, that would be Gallifrey and the Time Lords themselves. And we see it too, particularly when he talks about being enraged that any part of the Doctor was in him. And that includes, obviously, the gene splicing that they got from her a billion years ago. Now, I did like the division scene. This has uh, Commander Gat, which was the commander who was previously searching for Ru the Ruth do Doctor in uh, 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 the Jadoon episode. Um, She's talking to an early incarnation of the Doctor. We saw this person several times during that whole thing. And she's talking to a previous incarnation of the Doctor prior to the Ruth Doctor. Now, this may be an early iteration of what was seen in the Classic Who called the Celestial Intervention Agency. Yes, the CIA. Um, you know, the, the, the Time Lords just sat and they did their thing. They only watched. They never touched. But they did have the Celestial Intervention Agency for times when they wanted to covertly get things done. Um, and in fact, the CIA was the ones who sparked in and canon the last great time war with the Daleks by sending the fourth Doctor back in time to either destroy the Daleks or uh, uh, change their development as they were being created. That's what caused the time war. It's an episode called Genesis of the Daleks. It is one of the best uh, of the Fourth Doctor era. It's the Fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane. Uh, I can't go too much wrong with them. So, they were, and they were also mentioned in other episodes. So, if the Doctor initially was an agent of the CIA, it would explain why Ruth the Doctor and things that happened in that children for fugitive of the Jadoon episode. When we get to some of the things like, God, you know the, the idea of regenerating Cybermen? That is um, actually kind of terrifying, you know, because unless you actually disintegrate the Cybermen, it is an army that will keep coming forever. They kill them and come back, kill them and come back. Uh, you can only do it 12 times, but come on, man, you know, it's pretty damn good. And then the Master, when he says, for Gallifrey, for the Time Lords, for the end of the universe itself. That was a nice callback to Tenant's last episode of The End of Time, when Rassilon said, for victory, uh, for Gallifrey, for victory, for the end of time itself. Although, ending the universe would seem to make ambitions the ha Master has kind of pointless, because he wants to be ruler of the universe, not destroy it. Now, I do have cringe moments, always have cringe moments, even if they're small. I have a few, they're generally small. Um, one of them is Koshamis' uh, tent being any kind of barrier for the Cybermen. That seems kind of silly. The Cybermen know they're in there. Just burn down the tent. <laughs> Landing the ship, the Cybermen ship, on top of the ruins of buildings is a bad idea. You're going to cause damage to your own ship in the process. It would have been better just to hover above the Citadel rather than damage the ship by crushing down onto its ruins. The Cybermen appear to have gone to the Imperial Stormtrooper Marksmanship Academy about a dozen times. They should have killed Graham, Ryan, Yaz, and all the other humans. Uh, also, it was a darn good thing that none of their bombs and weapons killed Graham and Yaz, because they had a lot of them. Uh, the Master, being both a homicidal maniac and who is bent on universal domination and a suicidal main person, seems difficult to reconcile. He has... Uh, this big plan, but doesn't care if it's cut short by him being killed? I don't know, it's uh, kind of weird. Uh, the companions... <laughs> the companions conveniently finding the doctor at the Matrix, despite the fact that they hiked for miles and had nothing but rubble to sift through, is kind of convenient. How does everyone get on and off the war carrier to and from the Citadel? The Cybermen seem to transmat, that's their name, by the way, for in Doctor Who when you're doing, uh, you know, beaming around someplace, transmatting. They seem to transmat everywhere. Um, in any case, uh, they, uh, they plopped the ship down on top of the former tower, which is now rubble. You just wonder how they, you know, I mean, you do that, it's not like you're going to, you know, crush down to accidentally where you can have doors meeting doors. It just 
Doesn't make any sense. Landing that thing on top of the Citadel was just dumb. Uh, the board carrier blowing into a million pieces but not impacting anyone's ability to get off of it or accidentally destroying the Matrix is convenient. We all know, of course, the Master isn't dead, but man, this one's kind of a doozy. I mean, how is he going to come back from being at ground zero from an explosion that destroyed all life on Gallifrey? They just won't say. But, you know, we're going to look at it and go, how, who, how did he get back from that? That's a tough one to come back from. So now, there is a TARDIS on Earth that looks, whose chameleon circuit, which worked perfectly, made it look like a house. Um... Isn't the fact that a house just appeared in a vacant lot sort of going to be noticed? I mean, who owns the vacant lot? By the way, it's too bad that Chibno got rid of Unit because guarding this house for the rest of its existence would be their sort of thing to do. Also, how did the Jadun transmat into the TARDIS? Only one occasion that I can think of is anybody transmatted and the Jadun are not that bright. By the way, this Jadun cold case unit is looking at a really cold case because they're still looking for the doctor from when she was Ruth. And in that doctor's timeline, that could be anywhere probably a billion years in the past. <laughs> and I'm unclear why the Jadun sent the doctor to prison. Usually they just find someone guilty and then disintegrate them. So, But those are my very few, very few cringe moments. I really, really like this episode otherwise. So, the writer, Chris Chibnall. I always talk about the writing first because if you ain't got no script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. So the good and bad, ultimately, dramatically, lies with the writer. Well, until this episode, Chris Chibnall had produced scripts that at best rose to the level of mediocre. But with this episode, Chris Chibnall nails it. It is science fiction, it's time travel, it's monsters, it's history that touches all of Doctor Who, classic and modern. Frankly, the entire season should have been building up to this, the whole thing. There are now more potential story arcs than I can count. All Chibnall has to do is choose one of them and um, make it into what modern Who has always done very well, which is... One and done episodes with a classic four act dramatic structure that makes the audience walk away from any given episode feeling good. Only have one companion so that there is time to develop both the doctor and her companion in terms of character development. Now, in each one and done episode, information about a season long art is sort of dollop dow little at a time. The episodes are one and done. You can watch them and not have to worry about missing something. But if you are watching, you will see pieces of the puzzle getting dropped into each of these one and done episodes, such that the doctor becomes slowly aware that something's going on and is going to happen. Then in the season finale, um, most of the threads from the one and done episodes are all pulled together, uh, tied into a mostly very satisfying bow. And it is only mostly neat. It's not all of the little threads because you're going to leave a few threads hanging. Because finally, when that particular doctor, um, when, their, uh, when their entire tenure is over, you take these leftover threads, pull them together into a two or three part se season finale with that doctor, and all of the loose ends for that doctor pull into a very nice, satisfying bow. And the fans go away and the viewers go away You're going, wow, that was very cool. Now, you might say that Chibnall did this um, with the season, and he sort of did, just not very well. There were six episodes that contributed to the arc and four that didn't. And they should have all contributed to the arc, at least in some small way. The point is to keep the viewer guessing um, throughout the entire season, build up the tension. So when the climax is finally released, re reached at the very end of the uh, season, the viewer is just blown away at that point. Now this season, there were too much SJW wokeness that made Star Trek's Let That Be Your Last Battlefield look subtle. If you, you need to, Chris, listen to me carefully, eject all of that, give us just good, wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey science fiction, and we will all be happy. Even the casual viewer will be very, very happy. So we get down into some of the performances, the acting. How did that get there? <laughs> uh, okay. 
Jody Whitaker. Um, I tell you, that, I'm sorry, um, ladies, uh, call me a sexist pig if you like. But frankly, I've been listening to you guys squee about the doctor for 10 fracking years. It is my turn now. Um, Jody Whitaker is a beautiful woman. She is um, close enough to my age that it's not creepy that I find her hot. Yet at the same time, I've said this before, hot girls by themselves just don't do it for me. You can give me any airheaded supermodel, and I will not care about that nearly as much as I will an average-looking woman who has brains. Brains are what do it for me. So this episode, there was a lot of brains going on with uh, the doctor's character, and consequently, I thought she looked really, really hot. I just like it better. I find women sexy who are intelligent, not just necessarily physically attractive. But in terms of her acting, there were a lot of close-ups of Jodie Whittaker's face. The fact that she can consistently pull this off is rather amazing. See, you have to be really, really subtle when your face is filling an entire 1080p screen at like 42 inches like mine does in front of me. One movement too much of your face and you look like you're hamming it up. One movement too little and you look like a block of wood. The best way I can describe this is the fact that uh, most tonights, thank God it wasn't tonight, there was another rerun of Batwoman. I get, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> Batwoman's, Batwoman's the modern Plan 9 from outer space, and part of that is the star Ruby Rose. Um, you can, as I do, you watch these episodes on the same day within about six hours of each other, and the, the difference is night and day, you know doesn't matter what's going on ruby rose is a block of wood and jody whittaker is always brilliant it is night and day if you happen to watch those shows night and freaking day um, jody whittaker is very very good and they finally got a chance to use her and the doctor's doing something smart so i think that she looks really hot <laughs> Then there was Bradley Walsh as Graham. And as usual, he is my favorite companion. He's got his head screwed on tight. Um, and the speech that he has with Yaz is really great. It's well acted. It's fatherly. It's grandfatherly, maybe. It is a very good little speech. Um, it's the sort of thing that you'd want to hear from your father or something. If the chips were down and you didn't really know for sure if you were going to survive, is him saying, you know, you're really great. Um, it is, again, mostly in close-ups. And he plays it very well. And again, Doing something that's going to be on 42 inches in 1080p is tough. You have to be a good actor to do that. And if this is the last that we see of these companions, this would be a fine place for me to leave on, on those companions. Then there is Tosin Cole as Ryan. He doesn't have the same moments uh, they do with Graham and Yaz, but he does have that really good one with the basketball bomb. Uh, as I said in great moments, the fact that he can do this at all shows that how his character has developed, and Tosin Cole plays it well. You can tell that the character knows that this is something that physically he wouldn't have been able to do before. So when he nails it, he gets really excited. It's a nice moment and for the character and the audience. And again, if we walked out with these characters that they exited the series right now, it would be a good go-out moment. Amanda Gill as Yaz. Again, she has a fine time with Graham. Um, again, mostly close-ups, well-acted. And as with Graham, if this was the last we were going to see of these characters, I'd be okay with that. And there's Sacha Dewan as the master. Talked about him before, but man, you know, I remember how I said that it's a tough to do 1080p at 42 inches. This is a guy who is completely, 100%, over the fracking top. I mean, he's chewing the scenery, but it still works. It still works. Somehow, you know, he's a talented enough actor that he can sit there and chew the scenery all day long, and it still works. In fact, you find him just so much fun, you want to see him some more. He's, he's like the Emperor of the Galaxy from Star Wars. He's evil through and through. He enjoys being evil, <laughs> and he, he makes... You know, going nuts on screen works somehow. So, you know, great work by Sacha Dewan. I uh, love him. The other humans, I'm afraid I just have to lump together. Um, they were getting killed off so frequently. They were damn near cannon fodder. It's nice that a few of them at least made it to Earth. Um, but, you know, they didn't have any real character development. It was just dragging them along. 
to make them shoot at things. People shoot at them. Some of them die. You know, I, there's nothing wrong with them. Their performances were great. They, they did fine with what they were given. They just weren't given very much, so there isn't a hell of a lot to say about them. So, uh, let me see if I can get the name right here. In McElhaney as Co. Charmus. Um, liked him a lot. He was not a major character. He didn't have a ton to do here. But what he did do was very good because, of course, he started out last episode as sort of being this last sentinel left behind to see if anybody else showed up. And then, well, then people showed up, and it turns out he's actually been a soldier. He knows how to defend the things. He knows how to go about killing people. And, of course, he makes the ultimate sacrifice at the end that saves the doctor's life and, um, apparently anyway, kills all the Cybermen and the Master. Um, I liked how he played this. It was like he was, you know, when we first saw him, he's like old and just, you know, worn out and didn't care anymore. And then all of a sudden, he got his mojo back. I thought he played that really, really well. It's very nice. Um, Patrick O'Kane as a shot of the formerly lone Cyberman uh, didn't have as much here to do. Um, he was, you know, mostly expositional, walking around. I did like when he was looking for, um, you know, Yaz and Graham and the other humans inside of the Cybermen outfits. You know, obviously they didn't do it very well because he didn't figure out they were there. But, you know, his looking there and sniffing and all that, I thought that was nice. Uh, but again, here's, a, here's a, a bad guy who gets, you know, just taken out like almost as an afterthought. He's like, oh, really? Well, then in that case, you're done. You know, we've been messing with him for an episode and a half. You're done. You know, actually, two and a half episodes, really. You're done. <laughs> and the director on this was Jamie Magnus Stone. He directed the last episode as well. Um, my biggest criticism of the last episode was the shaky cam. There was too much of it, and you couldn't follow the action. Well, there isn't that much shaky cam here. There is a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff that's done on handheld cameras. But for some reason, none of it's so shaky that when you put it on my 42-inch, you can't follow the action. It was perfectly fine. And there's nothing that any of this that really jumped out at me as being extraordinary direction, but it was certainly effective, and it did what you were supposed to do. And again, there were a lot of close-ups of the Doctor, and the fact that that works, testimony to Jody, Jody Whitaker's acting. Very good. Cinematographer is the same one as last week, Sam Hazeman. Okay, now my regular viewers are going to hear this again. But I do it because I just did reach 200 viewers, and I keep hoping that I'm going to 200 subscribers, however, and I hope I keep getting more, and they may not have heard this. So, in a film or TV show, the director's job is to say, I want to get these shots. The cinematographer's job is to say, I can get you those shots. But sometimes they will talk to each other and come a little, little bit, and the cinematographer might say, you know, if we did something that's a little bit different, I can get these shots and they'll be a little bit more dramatic. And the director will think about it and go, yeah, that doesn't sound like a bad idea. And so by having this collaboration, they'll make the whole thing better. Now, I have no idea if that was going on here. There is no way to tell unless you are extremely familiar with the people's work, which I'm not, or unless you're sitting on the set and you know what's happening, which I wasn't. But whatever's going on here, well, they got the shots. They were lit well. Everything worked fine. The, uh, the uh, cinematography is good. There is no production designer listed, um, neither in the credits nor in IMDb. That's impossible. <laughs> you can't have a TV show or a film without a production designer. That's stupid. Uh, there are a lot of people in the art department, including uh, Lauren uh, Harper and Daniel Kennedy, who are listed as set designers. So when I'm talking a lot of the times about production design, we're talking about set design and things like that. So we're just going to blame that on these guys. Much of the sets, the War Carrier, uh, the uh, Co Shaman, Shaman's Tent, the practical exteriors, they were pretty much the same as the last episode. Um, again, my only problem is with Co Shaman's uh, tent being effective in somehow slowing the Cybermen down. But again, that's a script thing and not a design problem. It looked fine inside otherwise. It was amusing that the action around Coach Armand's tent and that general vicinity, that area, looks to be a gravel quarry. Uh, I'm sure that this is a callback to the fact, an intentional one, that a large number of classic Doctor Who episodes, when they'd shot on location, an alien planet, 
they would shoot in a gravel quarry because it was what they could afford. So they're doing this callback. I like it. Thank you. You know. Music as always by Sagun Akinola. Okay. I have to assume that new music cues were scored for this episode. However, as is always the case so far with Akinola, the music works. There's nothing wrong with it. I can always tell when something's wrong, but it's forgettable. I don't dislike it, but it doesn't stick in my head the way that Murray Gold's music did for 10 years. And I've talked about this before, but again, you know, assuming that I'm going to have new viewers, I'm going to talk about it again. A lot of people process information by having an internal dialogue. That is, they have words that are constantly moving through their head at all times, and what they choose to say is essentially an edited down version of those words. Now, my own inner dialogue operates both in English and in French because I became fluent in that language at a very early age. Now, I also have an inner dialogue that consists of music. It is almost exclusively orchestral film music because it's influenced by my 400 collection of film scores. A lot of people, you know, they get the music in their head and they just stuck there. They can't get rid of it. But mine is constantly running and I can at almost any time alter it to be some other track if I want to. Essentially, my head's kind of like an inner iPod. Now, the, um, the issue with Akinola's music is that my inner soundtrack finds it forgettable. Murray Gold's is part of the collection and I have never listened I don't think I've ever listened to Murray Gold's music on a soundtrack collection. It's just that his music in Doctor Who was so memorable that my inner soundtrack, my inner iPod, grabbed it and continues to play it whenever I want it. Um, this indication to me that this is very, very good music. The fact that my inner iPod just says, oh, I heard it once, I'm going to keep that music. Um, but having a generally unmemorable music like Agonola's is probably a sign that it just fits the action rather than being particularly brilliant. So again, I have no, I have no objections about the music. It all fits the action. It's just not memorable. So, sorry, Sagun. Um, you know, I'm not sure what to say about that. It may just be your style. I don't know but my inner iPod is not grabbing your music the way that it did with Murray Gold's. So, special effects supervisor is Sheila Wicken. She is the effects supervisor for the entire season. However, as always, the real work is done by a small army, and it's impossible to attribute any one effect to any one person. And with modern CGI, one really only notices the effects when they're bad. And there was certainly nothing bad here. It's all looked realistic and appropriate. I did like the uh, explosion of the war carrier uh, a lot in terms of just the effect. I mean, sure, in real life, the flaming debris would have fallen right down on top of the doctor and her friends, killing them all. But still, it was a very nice explosion. And there were certainly more green screens here than you'd probably imagine. And the fact that you have no idea where they had it means it was executed very well. Costume design was by Ray Holman, who has done the costume design for the entire season. And again, my longtime viewers are probably going to get sick of this, but uh, I have to say it again for new viewers because I'm starting to get some. Costumes should always tell you something about the person wearing them. So, for example, if I, you caught me on the street, I'd be wearing a T-shirt and jeans. Today's T-shirt was a Superman T-shirt with a big red S on my chest, and I had jeans. And that would tell you something about me as a person. I'm kind of a geeky guy who would wear a Superman T-shirt out in public. What I'm wearing now, and, and different people, what different people will, you know, decide to wear different things, it will tell you something about who they are depending on what they decide to wear. So what I'm wearing now is a costume. Nobody I know in Central America, in Central part of the United States, dead center of the United States, flyover country, nobody that I know wears something like this. This is a costume. This is me trying to project something of an image. I'm being kind of a folksy, down-home guy who's giving a review from a place that you don't usually get them. So that's saying something about me. So when you get to a show like Doctor Who, part of the costume designer's uh, job is to make sure that the costumes say something about the characters. Now, with the regulars, I mean, you know, the Doctor always wears the same thing. Um, the uh, companions generally wear very, very similar outfits from day to day, if not the same thing from episode to episode. So, I mean, all of that 
we've grown used to what that says about the character, and it does. It does. I, I, I always look at Graham. You know, he's he's usually wearing something that looks comfortable. You know, slacks and a shirt, oftentimes a jacket. You know, but he looks comfortable. He doesn't look like you know. It's not like you're looking at the king or the queen of England or something like that. You know, Great Britain. He's he's a comfortable looking guy. Similarly, the other characters. And when we get into um, you know, the, the uh, human refugees, I mean, as I said last week, you're talking about people who are fleeing Cybermen and been doing so for some time. They don't have the greatest looking clothes in the world. They look practically rags. That's what they're supposed to look like. Uh, when you get to, um, you know, our last sentinel there, I mean, he looks like somebody who's been wandering around and just not really caring very much and wearing whatever seems to matter. But when he when he turns into that other guy, you know, when he becomes the guy who gets his mojo back and goes to, goes to do the final ultimate sacrifice, all that stuff makes him look more regal, and that's intentional. You know, when he's first wearing it and you first see him, you don't get any impression of, of, re, of regalness. He doesn't look regal. But when he goes out and he's back up and he's doing his thing and, Doctor, you're going to let me do this, he looks regal. The, the stuff he's wearing looks like robes, and it makes him regal. So very, very good. Of course, the Cybermen, well, I, I don't know how much, I assume that's all, uh, that falls under the heading of costuming. Uh, but the Cybermen, of course, very similar to what we've seen in Cybermen in the past. It's what always happens. Cybermen evolve to some small extent over time. The makeup designer, none is listed again. And there had to be one. You can't do a show like Doctor Who without makeup. In fact, at the time of this recording, IMDb lists absolutely no makeup staff whatsoever. How, uh, uh, you know, every single one of the director's faces, doctor's faces we see, are uncredited, but there's nothing in IMDb, and the show does credit, at least in the show's credits itself, a makeup supervisor who is Emma Cohen. So we're going to have to assume that it's a supervisor. Maybe she designed this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> uh, makeup, again, should tell you things about the character. You know, if you're seeing a, um, a woman like the doctor who's relatively conservative is not wanting to look like over-feminized, then her makeup's going to be relatively, you know, um, subdued. Uh, I don't think there's anybody in here that we'd say the makeup was unsubdued for in terms of a female. I mean, they're all relatively subdued. Um, the men's makeup, it looks practical. Um, even when you get into characters uh, like uh, Koshamis, it still looks practical. So when we get into makeup that's you know practical, everything looks fine. The main thing you have to remember about makeup is 42 inch, 1080p. You know if your actor has the slightest skin blemish, blemish, then you're going to have to cover it over with makeup. I mean, me personally, right, sitting here doing these reviews. I have gotten away without wearing makeup in 1080p and the potential for my face to be on a 42-inch monitor. I never watch it that way. But potentially, I've gotten away without doing it just because of the very, very carefully way I've done my lighting. But I suspect on 42 inches you might be able to see some skin imperfections. Please don't tell me if you do. I don't need to know. Um, but you have to cover that stuff over for a TV. And if you do it wrong, it looks like there's caked makeup on. A lot of times when they're trying to cover the fact that an actor has lines or crow's feet or something like that, it will start to look caked on. Never happens here, which either means that they're hiring actors who somehow have no skin imperfections whatsoever or that the makeup is done as correctly. Um, the only other real sort of alien makeup that we see is from the formerly lone Cyberman, and it's the same makeup we've been seeing for two episodes now. It's very effective. Um, it makes him look like, you know, this sort of half man, um, you know, half cyber thing. It it's, makes sense. It looks good. It makes him look menacing. Very nice. Right up until he's just shrunk down, <laughs> just out of hand, completely out of hand. So. so at the end of any given review, we would ask ourselves, is it any good? Oh, hell Yes. I can unreservedly recommend this episode to anyone. Even if you suffer from the curse of the Fandai Master, you will probably still like this episode. And here is hoping, here is hoping that Chris Chibnall keeps giving us stories like this one. So, that is all that I have to say about that.
I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So, tonight, the Fandai Master holds a live stream to celebrate 200 subscribers and to review the first African-American horror film, Son of Ingaji. That's tonight, March 2nd, 2020, at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Pacific in North America. Don't miss the Fandai Master's review of 1940's Son of Ingaji. And that is all the time that we have for that. So thanks for watching. I would love to keep the conversation going. So that is it for Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing. Control minds.